Hey, what's up everybody? This is Anti Hero with Player One Gaming, and I'm coming at you today with another multi-class build for Baldur's Gate 3. For this one, we'll be making a spellcaster. And not just a spellcaster. This is one of the most powerful multi-class spellcasters in the game. The Sorlock. Now, a Sorlock is a sorcerer and a warlock multi-class. And it is one of the most infamous class builds from D&D. And there's a couple of reasons why this combination works so well together. Number one, they're both charisma-based spellcasters, meaning they use their charisma attribute to determine their efficiency with spellcasting. Also, the Warlock is good to multi-class with because it's very front-loaded. See, there are two different kinds of classes in D&D, the kind that really benefit from taking more levels in their own class because they gain really strong abilities in later levels, and the kind that are very front-loaded, with some of their best abilities coming very early on. Now, there are a few different ways to do a Sorlock build, but I'm gonna be showing you kind of the classic Sorlock, which is heavy on the Sork and light on the Lock. Because the Warlock is very front-loaded, they get some of their best stuff in the first two or three levels. And the Sorcerer? Well, honestly, the Sorcerer benefits a lot from just taking more Sorcerer. Some may even tell you not to multi-class, as just taking a single-class Sorcerer might be the way to go. And they wouldn't necessarily be wrong. Yes, high-level Sorks are very powerful. But ultimately, if you're going all the way to level 12, which you are in BG3, I think taking a dip in Warlock is the best way to go. There's a trade-off, sure. There's always an opportunity cost to multi-classing. Though, these are one of the cases where I think it's definitely worth it. One more thing I'd like to say before we get started. This build, and pretty much every build guide that I do, unless I state otherwise, will not be dependent on any magic items or in-game effects. While I will be going over some good magic items for this build at the end of the video, I'm not making a build dependent on those items. I do this because I don't want to tell you, hey, you have to go do this in the game in order for this build to work properly. Look, if there's some item that you get that drastically changes things, gives you a bonus or ability that has you thinking maybe you should tweak this build a little bit, then by all means, tweak it. Adjust accordingly. This guide is meant to be a jumping off point. You can follow it to a T, or you can tweak where you see fit. And that brings me to my last point, which is just remember this is just one build guide, and the choices made here are ultimately subjective ones. Now, without further ado, I present to you the Sorlock. Okay, level one. This is by far the level we will spend the most time with. This is really where we set the foundation of the character with race and ability scores and things like that. So we're going to do a pretty deep dive into level one here, starting with race. Now, Larian has set it up with the equal ability score bonuses that any race is really viable for any class in this game. But for this build, I'm going to recommend going with either a half-elf or a human. A big reason I'm recommending the human or the half-elf is honestly for the shield proficiency. I know it's a little bit out of the box to have a spellcaster wielding a shield, but this build's going to do it. They're going to have their staff in one hand and a shield in the other. And if you ask me, I think it looks pretty cool. You're building a true battle mage. So yeah, the shield will give you an extra two or even three in your armor class. So that's going to be good. We're going to be looking at a couple different ways to boost your AC. Make sure you're not as squishy as your typical spellcaster. So if I did have to pick between these two, if I had to say which is the choice that's more optimal, I'd have to go with the half-elf. In addition to this civil militia ability, which is the thing that gives you the shield proficiency, you're also going to get dark vision and fey ancestry, which gives you an advantage uh, against being charmed and magic can't put you to sleep. So dark vision is very handy and the Fey Ancestry is a nice little bonus as well. So I do think that the half elf is the more optimal choice. In addition to that, for the sub race, we're gonna be going with high half elf because we also get a bonus cantrip, the Firebolt, which is the highest damage dealing cantrip in the game. So it's a bonus cantrip too. It doesn't cost, normally we'd only be able to pick up four cantrips as a sorcerer in the beginning, but we get this extra one. So we will pick the Firebolt for that. Now we go down to select our subclass. Now all three of these are good. Wild Magic is probably the least optimal choice, but it is a whole lot of fun. So if you want a high fun factor, Wild Magic is a good choice. Storm Sorcery is also good, but for this build, we are gonna be going with the Draconic Bloodline. This is going to do several things for us, but starting with 
if you see down here, it is going to give us a bonus in our hit points and a bonus in our armor class as well. So this is another way that we're gonna get that AC up. Okay, so you'll notice with the Draconic Bloodline that you get these dragon scales on your face. Now, some of you might be like, oh, that's awesome. That's a great little touch. And some of you are like, I didn't really want the dragon scales. So fortunately, Larian gives you the option. If you go down here and just click on edit appearance, it'll take you over here and you'll notice that you have an extra tab now for Draconic Bloodline. And so you can go through these. They give you a few templates for how you want these scales to look. So you can change the design, make it however you want it to be. And it actually has an option here that allows you to remove the scales entirely, which is what I'm gonna go for, but it's all personal preference and the particular character that you wanna build. So it's nice to have those options. Also with Draconic Bloodline, you get to pick a Draconic Ancestry. What you're doing here is picking what color dragon your dragon ancestor was. And it's not just an aesthetic thing. Each one of these, as you can see in the parentheses, it's associated with a different type of damage. So eventually you're gonna get a resistance to this type of damage and also be able to do uh, additional damage with this element. But starting right away here at level one, it also gives you access to another kind of spell. So the ones I wanna look at for this particular build are the lightning and the cold damage. That is blue, white, silver and bronze and the reason that is is there's going to be a few different things with this build that are kind of like our bread and butter eldritch blast being one of them high damage aoe spells and also elemental damage specifically cold and lightning because we are going to use the mechanic where we apply the wet condition to our enemies and that doubles the damage of cold and lightning so we're going to be utilizing that a lot and all of these effects are going to be working in conjunction with one another so each one of these, blue, white, silver, and bronze, come with a different spell. For blue, we have Witch Bolt. This is a somewhat underwhelming spell. I'm gonna advise that you don't take blue. Thing about Witch Bolt is it doesn't do a ton of damage, and while you can reapply it on additional turns, the fact that it requires your concentration is a big count against it. We're gonna have a lot of concentration spells. We wanna be very careful how we use them and we will likely not be using Witch Bolt all that often. So we're gonna have better ways of dealing that lightning damage. So White has a very good spell. White has Armor of Agathis. And this is a fantastic spell that gives you temporary hit points as well as deals cold damage to your opponent when they attack you with a melee attack. Very powerful, especially when upcast it increases the amount of damage and hit points that you get from it. It's a great spell, but the thing is, is that I'm going to advise that you take the Fiend subclass when you take Warlock, and that subclass offers this spell. So unless you wanted to go with the alternate subclass, which is certainly an option for you if you wanted to do that, if you do do that, I would recommend maybe taking White. Otherwise, if you do end up going with the Fiend Warlock subclass, then... No reason to take white. You don't need to get this spell twice. So I would recommend at this point either silver or bronze. Silver gets you the feather fall spell. This is a great spell. It's one that you're not going to use much, but when you need it, you'll definitely be glad that you have it. Bronze gets you fog cloud, another good spell for stealth purposes, but this one does require concentration. And like I said, our concentration is gonna be stretched thin as it is. So that is why my ultimate recommendation here is to go with silver. Cold damage is a good pick, I think, and the Featherfall spell is, like I said, very handy to have when you want it. Okay, so now we're gonna take a look at the spells, starting with the cantrips. Now bear in mind, if you picked the High Half Elf, you have this Firebolt cantrip for free already here, so you do get one extra cantrip, but we get to pick four more, and there's some good choices here. However, the default that they selected for us, we're not going with these. Um, light is a really good spell, but we have dark vision. First, we're gonna go with Ray of Frost, um, and it deals decent damage and also slows your opponents down. And cold damage is our thang, so we're definitely taking Ray of Frost. Um, we're also gonna take Mage Hand, a floating hand that can do tasks for you, open doors and push buttons. Kind of like the Featherfall, you're not going to use it all the time, but when you want it, it's nice to have it. Minor Illusion, kind of same thing. It can be a handy little cantrip uh, used to distract your enemies, to make NPCs turn their backs on you. Uh, it can be very useful. 
Finally, uh, even though there are a few good choices here for this build, I'm going to recommend going with Shocking Grasp. That's what I'm taking at least. Um, two reasons for that. Number one, it is a damage dealing spell that is of melee distance. So it is nice to have the option at least to be able to switch to melee. Um, it's also another element. We have fire, cold, and now lightning. So we have three elements represented three options to go to if we need them, so that is good. So let's move on to level one spells. Now there are a lot of good choices in the level one spells. My recommendation is we get to pick two different spells here, and one of them should be a damage dealing spell. And the two they have for default here, um, I, I recommend picking one of the two of these, either Chromatic Orb or Magic Missile. Ultimately, you are going to replace both of these eventually as you begin to level up but you're gonna pick the one you want with you now at these early levels. Magic Missile has the benefit of firing three different beams so you can attack three different enemies. That's kind of its main selling point. Eventually you're gonna be able to do that with Eldritch Blast either way, but for now that is a uh, advantage with Magic Missile. Chromatic Orb, its big advantage is it, it does slightly more damage and also allows you to pick the element uh, that like the type of damage that you want to inflict which is great. I love that versatility. So that is why I'm going to pick Chromatic Orb here. And then for our second spell slot, there's a few choices. We got Mage Armor is good. Fog Cloud, another good one. Thunder Wave that can knock your enemies back. That's definitely handy, but you'll be able to do that with Eldritch Blast very soon. Uh, Mage Armor is great, though I'm not going to recommend it for this build because we are using the shield and the Draconic Ancestry, and we're pretty good with the AC. It actually wouldn't make a difference at this point. If you didn't want to use the shield, if you ended up going in a different direction, I do recommend Mage Armor. Otherwise, skip that for the shield spell and sleep, okay? So these we're going to take two of these eventually regardless, and I'm actually going to recommend going with sleep first. And the reason is because sleep's a great spell. First off, it, it's going to put your enemies to sleep and give you guaranteed crits on them when they're sleeping. It is a very powerful spell. The one thing about it, though, is it begins to taper off as you go up in levels. It becomes less effective. And that is why I'm going to recommend taking it now. The other spell, Shield, you're going to have that with you the whole time, all the way up to level 12. So take sleep now so you can get full use of it it's full potential at the early to mid levels and then we'll pick up shield in just a little bit all right next we're going to go to background you're welcome to choose anything you please here uh, my recommendation is that it at the very least has one charisma based skill that you gain proficiency in personally i like charlatan charlatan gets you the deception proficiency as well as sleight of hand which if you have a rogue in your party they will likely handle these but if you don't, well, someone's going to want to have sleight of hand. Someone is going to want to be able to pick locks and disarm traps. Why not let it be you? There's several other good options here. You're welcome to choose whichever one you like, but for this build, I am picking Charlatan. All right, next one, ability scores. Okay, so you can see from the star here that our primary ability score is Charisma. So we're going to want to assign our plus two bonus into this and max it out at 17. Uh, the reason this is is because it's our uh, spell casting ability. We're going to be using it to determine our efficiency with spells, uh, whether or not we hit with them and how much damage they do. Um, next, we're going to look at dexterity and constitution. Those are going to be our second and our third highest. You can go either way with this. There's pros and cons to both. The classic Sorlock build and what I'm going to recommend is constitution, but there are some that will tell you that dexterity is a good choice, and they're not wrong. I mean... Dexterity gets you several different things in this game. Like primarily why you would take Dexterity is that it affects your ranged and finesse weapons uh, modifier, right? Generally, if you're shooting a bow or going to be attacking with a rapier or a dagger, and this is a primary way of you attacking, you want a high Dexterity score. We're not going to be doing that with this build, however, so we don't have to worry about that part. Uh, but it also affects your initiative and your armor class. So this is why some people recommend Dexterity, but here's the thing. We're determining whether we're gonna put a 14 or a 16 in Dexterity. 
At the end of the day, this is just a one point difference modifier. A plus one in initiative is not going to be a game changer either way. It's not going to determine most of the time whether or not you are going first or last. And it's the same thing with armor class. I mean, it's gonna give you a plus one in AC, but we're already doing things to our AC to get it up there. You're gonna have plenty of AC with this build. I'm gonna get it up to 18, 19, even 20, depending on what items you're using. With the right spells cast, it could be even higher than that. That is plenty for a ranged spellcaster. You're not a frontliner or anything like that, though you probably could be with an AC of 20. The reason we want to go in Constitution, one, it's going to give us more hit points, so that's always good. We want to have a decent AC and a decent amount of hit points. They're both very important. But the other thing that it's used for is Constitution saving throws are used for determining whether or not you can remain concentrated uh, on those concentration spells during battle. When you get hit, you have to roll a constitution saving throw to see if you maintain that concentration on that spell. So constitution is very important for this build. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna take that plus one bonus that we have left, we're gonna put it in constitution. We're gonna wanna get the constitution to 16 and the dexterity to 14. The only way to do this is to dump two stats, not just one. So we already have strength dumped here all the way down to eight. We're gonna do the same with intelligence. And don't worry, I mean, this is gonna allow us to get that 16 and that 14. And honestly, I mean, people say what they will about min-maxing, and I agree with a lot of the counts against min-maxing. I, I don't min-max things a lot of times if it gets in the way of the narrative. I always want the narrative to fit like the build that I'm going for. But the thing is, with min-maxing with ability scores, in, in my opinion, it's more realistic, right? Like, this is how human beings are. I mean, this is a half-elf, technically, I guess. But we are imperfect, and we, um, in some instances, are above average in things. In some instances, we are average, which, like the wisdom here, at a 10, a neutral modifier, that's considered average, right? And strength and intelligence, that's slightly below average. You're not a complete idiot and a complete weakling, but... You, you are slightly a below average here is what these scores represent. And this is true with most people, I think. You're good at some things and average at some things and bad at some things, you know? So this is a good setup it, it, from a narrative standpoint and also from an optimal scores standpoint. So that's how we're gonna set up the ability scores. And then lastly, we are gonna go over to skill proficiencies real quick, but they've got a They've got it looking pretty good here. I don't really think there's anything that we're going to change. Um, this has us proficient in sleight of hand, arcana, deception, and persuasion. Um, that's good. I, my recommendation is always if you're going to be like a face of the party, you should be proficient in two of the three different ways to have social interactions. So the three ways being deception, intimidation, and persuasion. And next we have Arcana, which is good. It kind of mitigates the low intelligence score we have. At least gives us a positive number in Arcana. If this was a wizard, maybe it should be higher. And it would be, because a wizard would be intelligent, right? Sorcerers are different. The magic is within them. It's not learned. But a little bit in Arcana is good. And then that sleight of hand, which is useful if you need it. All right, and that is it for level one. Okay, level two. For our model the rest of the way, this is going to be a human. This is actually Gale. Uh, I have a mod installed that allows me to change the appearance of companions. And I was messing around respecking companions for build videos and things like that. So this is actually Gale. He looks a little bit different than we're used to, but he's going to be doing a little modeling for us today. And at level two, we come to kind of a crossroads. We, we've got to make a decision here about when we are taking those warlock levels. There are two popular schools of thought here. One is to jump into Warlock right away. By multiclassing right away, you are going to get Eldritch Blast immediately, the Invocations, and Medium Armor Proficiency. Medium Armor Proficiency is not bad to get right now, considering that top-notch magic item, the robe that really goes perfectly with this build. You're not going to get that until about the middle of Act 2. So early on, if you didn't want to go with the sorcerer's robes and you wanted that warlock medium armor, it's not a bad idea. So those are the benefits of going with warlock right away. However, even though it takes a little bit more patience, I do think that the more optimal choice is to stay at sorcerer for the first five levels. The benefit of doing this is that those early game levels are going to feel much stronger. 
you're not delaying your spell progression as much. You're going to get access to level 2 and 3 spells much faster. And it's just going to feel like a little bit less of a grind in the early game. You're free to choose any avenue you like. I have chapter markers in this video so you can jump back and forth and really do the level progression any way that you want to. However, in this video, just to make it a little bit easier, I'm going to be going Sorcerer for the first five levels. All right, so at level two Sorcerer, this is where we get meta magic. We start with two Sorcery points. Every level of Sorcerer after that, we get an additional Sorcery point. And Sorcery points, you can use these to use your meta magic, which is kind of the Sorcerer's primary ability. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. But you should also note that sorcery points and spell slots work hand in hand. You can actually use unspent spell slots and turn them into more sorcery points and vice versa. You can spend sorcery points to get more spell slots. Okay, so before we dive more into meta magic, we're going to pick one more level one spell here. And as mentioned previously, if we took sleep the first time around, we're going to take shield for level two. All right, so we grab shield. That's gonna increase our armor class by five. Also, we take no damage from magic missile. That doesn't really come up all that often, but it's a strong spell. You use it as a reaction to save yourself from getting hit. So grab that, and then we'll go down to meta magic. Now we get to pick two of these four meta magic skills. And the one must pick we have on this list is twin spell. What twin spell allows us to do is we take a single target spell. We'll just use Chromatic Orb as an example, because we have that. If we decide to use Twin Spell on Chromatic Orb, we can now target two different opponents with that spell at the same time. So that's right, it takes a single target spell and makes it a dual target spell. So very powerful. We'll definitely want to pick that up. The other three options here are all decent ones. We've got Careful Spell. This allows allies to automatically succeed in their saving throws. So if you want to launch a fireball out in the battlefield, you don't have to worry about hitting your teammates, which is huge, very strong. Uh, then there's Distance Spell. Does just what you think it would do. It increases the range of your spell by 50%. And perhaps its strongest feature is it takes melee spells and turns them into range spells. So that can be very useful. And finally, there is Extend Spell, which allows you to double the duration of conditions and things like that that are caused by spells. Surfaces like the ice surface from some of the cold damage spells. Honestly, these are all very good options. I personally am going to pick careful spell because I love being able to toss a AoE damage spell out in the battlefield and not have to worry about hitting my opponents. All right, level three. Here we're gonna pick up a additional sorcery point, a couple more spell slots. And now we get level two spells. There are lots of good ones here. We got Shatter and Scorching Ray, Misty Step, which is honestly one of the most useful spells in the game. We got Knock and Invisibility, very useful, of course. Hold Person. Hold Person is one of the strongest spells in the game. We are definitely going to be taking that at some point. We'll talk about it a little bit more soon, but for right now, I'm going to recommend that you take Cloud of Daggers. Cloud of Daggers is one of the more powerful AoE spells in this game, and just at level 2. It does just what the name suggests. It summons a cloud of daggers spinning around your enemies, and anyone caught in the cloud takes damage. That's right, they just take damage. That's what makes this spell so good. While the area of effect is relatively small, and because it's a level 2 spell, the damage isn't insane or anything, but what really makes this spell so great is that unlike many ongoing AoE spells, this one does not prompt a saving throw. Furthermore, it doesn't even prompt an attack roll. That's right, if you're caught up in the Cloud of Daggers, you just straight up take damage. You take damage when the spell is cast on you, you take damage when you start your turn in the daggers, and you take damage when you're blown through the daggers or have to walk through them. This works perfectly with this build because when we do take those levels of Warlock, a big part of what makes this build so strong is that we're going to be using high damage AoE spells and then Eldritch Blast to blast our opponents through them. So Cloud of Daggers is a must pick here. We're going to grab that. And then we get to pick another meta magic. And again, even though there's been a couple added to the list, the choice here is clear. We are taking Quicken Spell. In my opinion, this is probably the strongest metamagic option available. 
It's very simple. What it does is it allows you to cast a spell that normally costs an action and cast it as a bonus action instead essentially allowing you to cast two spells in one turn. Okay, so we grab Quicken Spell and then level on up to level four. At level four, we get to pick another cantrip, and there's a few to choose from here. You'll notice that I still have Firebolt available on this list. That's just because this is a human. If you did roll with the high half-elf, you already have Firebolt. And if that's the case, I recommend going with Light here. Even as a high half-elf who has dark vision, it's likely that one of your companions doesn't, and light is invaluable in this case. You can light up the battlefield and make sure that they are not rolling with disadvantage. Now, if everyone in your party has dark vision, at that point, I guess I recommend taking Bone Chill, which is another strong cantrip that's available. And then once you've selected your cantrip, we're going to go down and pick one more level 2 spell here, and that's going to be Hold Person. Again, Hold Person is one of the stronger spells in the game, in my opinion, because not only does it hold your opponent in place for potentially several turns, but it also makes any attack made within like 10 feet an auto crit. Yeah, you heard that right. You get an automatic critical hit when Hold Person is cast. And after you hit them, they just stay in Hold Person. So you can auto crit them over and over again. This is another situation where this spell works really well with this build, because there'll be times where if another player in your party has an ongoing AoE spell going with their concentration, you can use your concentration to use hold person and hold them in that AoE damage. So I definitely recommend picking this up. Okay, so then we are going to go down and we're going to be able to take our first feat in the game. And I'm actually just going to recommend that we go with an ability score improvement. We want to get that charisma as high as possible. So this is an easy choice here. We're just going to take that SAI, put both points into Charisma to get it up to a 19, and we're good to go. And level 5. Do one more Sorcerer here. Go down to Spells, and we get level 3 Spells. Another batch of some really strong spells to choose from. Level 3 Spells are some of my favorites in the game. So this is not an easy choice just to pick one. In fact, I'm going to recommend that we pick two here. We're going to pick one here, and then we're going to go down and replace spell and take another. Some really good choices here, though, are Counterspell. Counterspell is extremely useful. I definitely recommend that you or someone in your party gets it eventually. It's a reaction. You can use it whenever an opponent is going to cast a powerful spell on you or your party. You can use it to counter that spell, to basically cancel it out. So extremely useful. There's Fireball. You know it. You love it. Of course, it's Fireball. Always a viable option. Haste. Haste is going to be a must-pick spell for this build. It is so powerful. It allows you to gain another action. So you get two actions. You become faster. You increase your movement speed. And you get a plus two to your AC. And whoever casts it on you, as long as they can keep their concentration, it can last up to 10 turns. And if that wasn't enough, you can use Twin Spell with it. So you can use Twin Spell, cast Haste on yourself and another party member. So Haste will be a must pick, and then Lightning Bolt. Lightning Bolt is basically the lightning damage version of Fireball, with the biggest difference being that Fireball is a sphere template, and Lightning Bolt is a straight line. But because we're going to be utilizing so much cold and lightning damage for this build, I know that Fireball gets all the glory, but Lightning Bolt is very strong. And given the fact that we're going to be using a lot of cold and lightning damage with this build, coupled with the wet condition mechanic, I'm very much going to recommend that we go with Lightning Bolt. So the two spells we're going to pick up here are Haste and Lightning Bolt. So grab one of them up here, and then we're going to go down to Replace Spell. And it's pretty safe to say that we can get rid of Chromatic Orb now. We no longer have too much use for it as we're leveling up. So we will replace Chromatic Orb and we will get Lightning Bolt for that. All right, level six. And this is where the multi-class begins. You've waited patiently, or maybe you haven't, and you took Warlock at level two, which is fine. But if you have waited, now's the time. We can multi-class, we'll select Warlock. And the first thing we'll do is go over to Cantrips and select two of those. And this is what you've been waiting so patiently for. One Cantrip to rule them all, Eldritch Blast. And hey, one reward for waiting patiently 
is your Eldritch Blast has immediately been leveled up because you are past level 5. Cantrips level up at level 5 and level 11. Most damage dealing cantrips will simply double the damage output. So like Firebolt does 1d10 and then 2d10 and then 3d10. But with Eldritch Blast, it stays at 1d10, but it gives you an additional beam every time, which is actually far stronger because you can target multiple opponents. And that's not all. With the magic items I'm going to share with you at the end of the video, you are going to be doing an insane amount of damage with Eldritch Blast. It is going to be so OP, you're going to be left wondering how they even let you cast it at will as a cantrip. So we get to pick one more cantrip in addition to this. And the two that I would probably recommend looking at is either Bone Chill, which is a damage dealing cantrip. It deals necrotic damage and it does some okay damage, but really its strong selling point here is that it prevents targets from healing on their next turn. Also, undead targets get disadvantage on attack rolls. So this is a pretty strong cantrip. If you wanted to get a non-damage dealing cantrip, you could always go with what they have a default here, which is Blade Ward, decent little buff spell. Ultimately, we'd take both of these either way. So I'm just going to leave Blade Ward there because we have so many damage dealing spells to begin with. But by the end of it all, we'll have Bone Chill as well. So you can really pick whichever one you want. Okay, next we get to pick a Warlock subclass. All right, so these are all pretty good. If you wanted to go with the Great Old One or the Archfey, there's certainly reasons for doing so. But for this build, for me, I'm going to pick the Fiend. For one, Armor of Agathis, as I've already mentioned, is a very strong spell. On top of that, we get a ability called the Dark One's Blessing, which gives us temporary hit points. So pretty good. So I will roll with the Fiend, and then we will go down here and select a couple more spells. As I mentioned, we're already taking Armor of Agathis, so that leaves us one more spot to pick. A few really good options here. Command is fantastic. Goes very well with this build as well. We'll definitely be picking it up, but I think we'll wait till next level to do that. Hellish Rebuke is also a good spell to have. It's a reaction. However, my recommendation is Hex. Hex allows us to do an additional 1d6 of damage to our opponents every time we attack them. That's not every turn. It's every time we attack. So if you're using Twin Spell or Eldritch Blast or anything that has you targeting multiple opponents or attacking multiple times like with Haste or Potion of Speed, Every time that you deal damage, there's an additional 1d6 added to it. So Hex is very strong for a level 1 spell. We're definitely picking that up. And with that, we will go on to level 7. Grab our second level of Warlock. Go back to these spells. And as I mentioned, we will take Command. Command is just a really good spell that's made even better with this build because we get to twin it. So we can twin this spell and command not just one, but two opponents to run away or move closer or drop their weapons or fall on the ground or whatever we want them to do. It's fantastic. So if you want a couple of your enemies to lay down in your cloud of daggers, absolutely feel free. Perhaps the best part about this is it does not require concentration. So you can double this up with some of your AOE spells that do require concentration, no problem. All right, and here we get our Eldritch Invocations. And if you've been playing with Eldritch Blast up until now and wondering what's the big deal with this spell, well, it's really not until the Warlock takes their invocations that Eldritch Blast can realize its true potential. So even though this is a long list, and there's certainly good choices here, if you're building a character that is going to be utilizing Eldritch Blast in any kind of significant way, the two choices here are clear. You're going to take Agonizing Blast and Repelling Blast. Agonizing Blast is going to allow you to add your Charisma modifier to the damage of every beam. And Repelling Blast is going to allow you to blast your opponent's back away from you. And as I mentioned, that's significant when you want to blast them into your AoE spells. Or maybe just off a cliff. Either way, your Eldritch Blast just got a whole lot stronger. Alright, so we're going to level up on the level 8. And this is where I recommend going back to Sorcerer and just taking Sorcerer the rest of the way. If you did want to stick with one more level of Warlock, you certainly can do so. In doing that, you will be able to take a Pact Boon, which is another good ability that the Warlock gets. However, if you want to choose the most optimal path for this character, I do believe that going back to Sorcerer at this point and taking the Sorcerer the rest of the way is the best way to go. And that's what we're going to do here. So at level 8, we are going to be at level 6 Sorcerer. And that's significant because we get some subclass features here. 
the Elemental Affinity ability. So if you remember when we took our Dragon Ancestry, we have that associated element that allows us to add our Charisma modifier to that elemental damage, as well as to spend a Sorcery point to gain resistance to that damage type. And we also get to pick another level 3 spell here. If you just can't help yourself and you have to take Fireball, I completely understand. I don't blame you for a second. Though my recommendation is to take Counterspell, especially if no one else in your party has it. It's just too powerful to pass up, so I'm going to snag Counterspell. And I'm also going to go down to Replace Spell. I'm going to get rid of Sleep as much as I love Sleep. At this point in the game, you're a level 8 character, and a lot of the opponents that you're facing have a lot of hit points, which means you're going to be using Sleep less and less. So my recommendation is to swap it out for one of these more valuable level 2 or level 3 spells. Again, if you really wanted to take Fireball, I don't blame you. This could be a spot where you could do that, and if you already have something like Amulet of Misty Step or the Disintegrating Nightwalker Boots, and you have Misty Step available to you, absolutely take Fireball. But if you don't already have Misty Step, now's the time to definitely pick it up. I actually recommend trying to get everyone in your party to have it. It is, in my opinion, the most widely used spell outside of maybe Guidance in the entire game. I actually did a video that shows you all the different ways that you can get Misty Step. You could essentially have Misty Step for every member of your party. So if you want to check out that video, I'll put the link above. And for now, we are going to level up to level 9. And level 9 brings level 4 spells. Okay, so we got two different damage dealing spells we're looking at here. We have Wall of Fire. I gotta be honest, I love this spell. It is a fantastic AoE spell that, just as the name suggests, allow you to build a great wall of fire. So there's all sorts of fun you can have with that. And then there's Ice Storm, which is another cold damage spell that we're definitely going to want to pick up. Ultimately, we're taking both of these spells. It's just a matter of which one we take right now. I'm actually going to go with Ice Storm. It's cold damage, so it matches my Draconic Ancestry damage type. And also, you know I love that cold and lightning damage with the wet conditions. So I'm going to grab that. Not to mention, it does not require concentration, whereas Wall of Fire does. So we have plenty of concentration spells. It's nice to have an AoE spell that does not require concentration. So we'll pick Ice Storm for now. But no worries, because we are not leaving Wall of Fire behind. Right now, we're going to level on up to level 10. Right away, we're going to be able to pick a spell. And you guessed it. We're picking Wall of Fire. So once we've done that, you can just go right on down here to Feet, and we get to pick another Feet. And this is where I'll mention that if you have gotten some in-game item that has brought your Charisma up, and you are already at 20, you could certainly look into taking any one of these amazing feats that the game has to offer. I personally think that you couldn't go wrong with Warcaster. It's a great feat, and what it does is it gives you Advantage on your saving throws to maintain concentration on a spell. So as you can see how useful that would be. And then on top of that, it allows you to use a reaction to cast Shocking Grasp for free if a target moves out of your melee range. And I definitely recommend it, like I said, if your Charisma is already at a 20 somehow. If it's not, I think you have to go Ability Score Improvement. What that's going to allow you to do is get your Charisma up to 20, which is what we want. And then it also gives you a point in Constitution. And just one extra point in Constitution here, as you can see, gives you 10 more hit points. It takes it from 82 points to 92. And by the end of the game, when you're at level 12, it's going to give you 12 additional hit points. And then we will level up again to level 11. And congratulations, we now have level 5 spells. Now, there's two damage dealing ones that we will be eyeing up. But if you did want to go another way with it, two non-damage dealing spells that I recommend are Telekinesis and Hold Monster. And Hold Monster is just like Hold Person, except you can use it against non-humanoid creatures. So if you had both Hold Person and Hold Monster, you're kind of covering all your bases there and can pretty much cast it on whoever. However, being that this is our resident Blaster Mage, we are going to be looking at two damage dealing spells. We're going to be looking at Cone of Cold and Cloud Kill. Both are very strong, just a matter of which one we want to pick first. Now, even though I've been pushing cold damage this whole time, I'm actually going to recommend we take Cloud Kill first. Cloud Kill is a very strong spell that allows us to cast a poisonous cloud on the battlefield. 
Now it does some strong damage, but the real selling point of this spell is that number one, the area of effect is massive. It's much, much bigger than Cloud of Daggers and even bigger than Fireball. It covers a big area of the battlefield. And then on top of that, we have the ability to reposition the Poisonous Cloud on subsequent turns. Now, while this does cost an action, we don't have to expend another spell slot to do so. We can just move the cloud wherever we want because ultimately enemies are going to run out of it, right? So then on our turn, we can just move the cloud back in. And when we do that, the enemy takes damage. And then on the start of their turn, whether or not they move out of it or not, they still take damage again. So this is going to be a very powerful one. We are going to pick that up now, but not to worry, Cone of Cold. We are coming back for you because this is going to take us to level 12, the final level in the game. And here we're going to get to pick a cantrip. If you haven't taken Bone Chill yet, that's what I recommend. If you already took Bone Chill, maybe Blade Ward or something else is available. We'll just grab that, grab our last cantrip. Then we'll come back down here for Cone of Cold. We did not forget about you. Grab that. And then finally, we get to pick one more meta magic. Okay, so we got a couple new options here. We have Subtle Spell. This allows us to cast a spell even if we're silenced. Now, this is definitely nerfed a little bit from the tabletop 5e version of Subtle Spell, which I think is a little bit stronger. The problem with this one, I think it's just too situational. So instead, I'm going to be looking at Heightened Spell which gives disadvantage to your opponent's saving throws. So anytime I can impose disadvantage on my opponents, I'm going to take that. I think Heightened Spell is a strong choice here, and that's the one I'm going to recommend. All right, guys, that does it. Levels 1 through 12 of the Sorlock. All right, before I go, we got magic items. I'm going to be doing this quick and dirty because this video is already running pretty long at this point. I'm just touching on a few magic items that you should keep an eye out for. We're going to be focused on staffs, robes, and headgear. It's not to say that there's not good gloves, boots, amulets, or rings, but at the end of the day, this is not a magic items video. Now, I will say most of these that are perfect for this build, you don't pick up until later on in the game, but I'm going to share a few with you that are at least worth taking a look at that you can get in the early game in Act 1. So I'll do these in chronological order, the order that you're most likely to pick them up in, the first item that you can get very early on in the game is Rain Dancer. This is a staff that can be used to cast the Crate Water spell. This is certainly handy, though you'll likely only use it very early on. And then I recommend passing it off probably to a druid or a wizard in your party. Because not too long after that, you're going to gain access to the Spell Sparkler. This is a staff that's going to be able to give you lightning charges, so that's pretty powerful. You're going to be able to get this from rescuing the Grand Duke at Joaquin's Rest. But you just continue to upgrade because later on in Act 1, in the Underdark, you can get your hands on a staff called Morning Frost. Morning Frost gives you a bonus to your cold damage, so that fits with this build nicely. And you can get this in the Underdark, but the thing about this one is it takes a little footwork. The staff is in three pieces. You have to go to three different locations, each with the body of a different drow. The first drow is right by where you fight the specter which is a battle that's on the west side of the Saloon Knight outpost. The second piece can be taken off a drow in the Mykonid colony in the vault that they give you access to after you defeat the Dwergar. And a third piece is found on a drow that's right next to the Susar tree. Once you have all three pieces, you put them together and you have your Morning Frost staff. You'll be rolling with this staff for the rest of Act 1, all of Act 2, and all the way up until you roll into Baldur's Gate in Act 3. But not so fast, before we get to Act 3, we're going to make a stop into Act 2, and this is where you're going to find the absolute best robes for this build. And that is the Potent Robe. The Potent Robe is going to allow your cantrips to deal your Charisma modifier to the damage twice. Yeah, and don't forget that's per beam with Eldritch Blast. This robe was tailor fit for the Sorlock, and you will roll with it for the remainder of the game. This can be found in Moonrise Towers, it's a quest reward for rescuing the tieflings. All right, heading into Act 3, this is when we really turn things up to 11. Immediately upon arriving in Baldur's Gate, I suggest you get to the lower city and find sorcerous sundries as quickly as possible. There are several interesting toys at this location, including a couple of items you are definitely going to want to get. Sorcerer's Sundries is a magic shop. If you just go directly in and talk to the merchant, they'll be selling the hat Birthright. This is an absolute must pick. 
It gives you a plus two in charisma and caps at not 20, but 22. This means a plus six modifier to your charisma. This coupled with the potent robe is going to take your Eldritch Blast to a whole nother level. We're talking about a guaranteed 12 extra damage for each beam. That's 36 guaranteed damage on top of whatever you're already doing with Eldritch Blast. And this is a cantrip. You can just spam it. That is insane. It breaks the game, if I'm being honest. Not to mention that you're gonna be completely irresistible in all social situations. And for those of you who don't wanna be game-breakingly OP, I do have an alternate option for some of these items that I'll mention in just a moment. But while we're still at Sorcerer Sundries, let me just say you wanna pick up the Marco Eschker Staff. This is a legendary quarter staff. This thing is very powerful. Gives you a plus one to spell save DC and spell attack rolls. Allows you to cast a spell without burning a slot and also has a pretty powerful spell called Koreska's Favor. This can be found in Leroican's Tower. You'll have to get through Leroican, get through his puzzles, but once you do, you'll gain access to this staff. For those of you who are wondering where I got my shield at, this big gold shield, it's called Viconia's Walking Fortress. It's a plus three to your AC instead of just a plus two. It knocks your enemies prone with two to eight force damage, has a powerful action called Reflective Shell that reflects ranged attacks, and the spell Warding Bond. This is also available in Act 3 when you defeat the leader of the Shar Worshippers. All right, lastly, for anybody looking for an alternate option or wondering where I got the hood and robe that my character model was wearing, this is actually a set. It's the Weave set. There's the Robe of the Weave, the Hood of the Weave, and Cloak of the Weave. All of these give you bonus to your spell save DC and attack rolls. The Robe of the Weave is also found in Leroican's Tower directly across from his staff. The Hood of the Weave is available in the lower city right on the water in a place called Philgrave's Mansion. There's a mummy lord in there who's a merchant. You can buy it from him. And the Cloak of the Weave can be purchased from Helsick in the lower city. All right, guys, that's it for the magic items. There's a lot more great magic items out there, though. Some I'm sure I don't even know about. So if you'd like to share some of your favorites in the comments below, please feel free to do so. Just make sure to watch out for spoilers, please. But that'll do it for this video. This is my version of the Sorlock. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, I just ask that you hit the like button. And if you're interested in seeing more videos like this in the future, please subscribe to the channel. Like and subscribe. It doesn't cost you anything. Just click a couple buttons. Really helps me out. I do appreciate it. And that'll conclude this build video. I hope you all have fun with it, and I'll see you next time.